Breaking through the rhetoric, breaking down the issues from the nation's capital. This is DC Breakdown. Good evening, I'm Angela Ray. Ferguson, Missouri residents are committed to finding solutions to race relations in their community. The problems that exist between residents and law enforcement are not confined to Missouri. It's a concern in neighborhoods and cities across the country. In Los Angeles, an unarmed man was shot and killed by police just two days after Michael Brown was gunned down in Ferguson. And just like in Ferguson, witness and police accounts in L.A. are dramatically different. Here's more from Stephanie Elam. As Ferguson, Missouri continues to grapple with the shooting death of Michael Brown by a police officer, another family and community is mourning a similar loss of yet another unarmed young black man. We've had our own Michael Brown, Ezel Ford, gunned down right here. My son was a good kid. Neighbors say 25-year-old Ezel Ford was well known in the South Los Angeles community. Everybody in the neighborhood took care of Ezel Ford. An undercurrent of police mistrust has boiled over here before, the L.A. riots in 1992. Some residents are again on edge. They're in fear of the police department. It was just after 8 p.m. on August 11th when two officers from the Los Angeles Police Department confronted Ford as he was walking in his neighborhood. Police say Ford made, quote, suspicious movements, end quote, and looked like he was trying to conceal his hands before allegedly grabbing one of the officers. A violent altercation ensued where the, where the suspect actually attempted to grab uh, the officer's gun. Police say Ford and the officer fell to the ground in the struggle before both the officer and his partner fired their weapons at Ford. Ford would later die at the hospital. But Ashanti Harris, who allegedly witnessed the situation unfold from his apartment, saw things differently. The police jumped out on him with the guns drawn out. He put his hands up, they wrestled him down to the ground, one shot went off, and then two seconds went by and another shot went off, and then I'll say the other officer told him to shoot him again, another officer, and he shot him again in the back while he was on the ground. He couldn't fight back, two big cops are on top of him. They let Ezell die. Now more than two weeks after the shooting, the LAPD has named the officers, 12-year police veteran Charlton Wampler and Antonio Villegas on the force for eight years. No justice, no peace. In the days since Ford's death, the community has organized marches to protest police brutality. How do you explain when you have this level of deadly force against those that are not even accused of committing a crime and are not even armed? But LAPD says the community should not rush to judgment as the investigation is ongoing. It's important to us uh, that we be transparent, that we be open, that we demonstrate as much as we can uh, in terms of the viability of the investigation because the public's trust is, is at the forefront. Justice. Yes. Justice for yes. Ezel. We just want some kind of justice. Some kind of justice and answers. All we want to know is why you do it. Los Angeles, Ferguson, Missouri, New York City, all cities where tensions between residents and police are high. So how can these problems be resolved? Today we're joined in the studio by two former members of law enforcement, retired Chief Deputy U.S. Marshal Matthew Fogg, a D.C. Breakdown fan favorite, and former Maryland State Police Captain Lee Maddox. Good to have you both in the studio. Uh, I'm going to take advantage of having such illustrious guests and just get you to educate me on all things law enforcement. First of all, what made you want to get into the business of serving and protecting? Well, it's a very long story, but I'll make it short. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I was when I was a teenager, after I graduated from high school, my best friend was murdered by a drug gang on the Lower Eastern Shore of Salisbury, and left for dead. And she festered in the summer heat for three months before the police finally found her decomposed body, and my life path was altered as a result. My goodness! Wow. wow. That's a Matthew. For me, I, I had an encounter with the police where I was locked up, falsely locked up, and uh, how old were you? It, uh, it just turned 18. Oh my goodness! It's traumatizing. Put me in, put me in the lockup for two days. <gasps> On a Saturday, they came and got me Saturday morning. When Monday, they realized they had locked up the wrong person. <gasps> I'm, matter of fact, I was the person that called the police, and they got the witnesses turned around, mixed <gasps> up as a suspect. Uh, that traumatic experience, going through that, uh, everything I. 
it was in ways it was good I went through it because I had a chance to see what it was like to right. actually be in handcuffs to actually be put behind That's bars right. and know what falsely accused would mean yes but uh, and, it, and the white officer that did it I remember talking to him saying listen you got the wrong guy and it was like he just didn't want to hear anything I said until they found out they had made the mistake but what I what I like about your story is that you weren't deterred from becoming a law enforcement officer. If anything else, you said no. That's you were right. more resolute that I want to, to follow this path. That's exactly right. And when I got into college and I switched to the criminal justice administration, I always had that in the back of my mind that I want to get this thing straight. And it actually ended up haunting me later in even trying to get a job till we got it straightened out. But it was just that whole process. But it pushed it pushed me in that direction big time. And as an African American male, where was this? Where did, where did this Washington, happen? Washington D.C. happened oh, right in wow. Washington D.C. Okay. And so you know, I came up in the civil rights movement, so yeah. I couldn't get in the boys' club because it was so whites only. So I remember Martin Luther King coming to Washington D.C. Uh, my brothers and us, we marched down there with the people. So I got a chance to see the civil rights movement. Yeah. A lot of it in person, and then on television. Yeah, and that impacted you how, as, with respect to you becoming law enforcement? Well, it made me realize that the changes needed to be made, and you needed somebody there that believed in the changes and could make the changes. Certainly, when you talk about law enforcement, there's a lot. You're, you're dealing with a culture. You're coming into a situation where if you're trying to make change and the powers that be don't want to see that change, then it, then it becomes a friction. But it doesn't mean you can't do it, and my, my career is a testimony to that. Mm -hmm. um, t tell me, and I'm always curious as to, to how you decide which, um, which portion of law enforcement you want, would like to go into. Like You decided to become a, a U.S. Deputy Marshal. You decided to be with the Maryland State Police. Um, tell me, how did you come about making this decision? Well, my father, uh, a former Marine, uh, Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Marine Corps, uh, spent ten years dragging me all across the country and instilling his discipline into my life. So when I finally um, realized that the police were un unable to effectively investigate this tragic murder, I was very distraught that they, they, they didn't even want to go and search for her. They wrote her off as a missing person. And mm. I was so angry. I couldn't think of anything else to do except go to the most well-trained, the most well-respected State Department in Maryland, and I banged on the front door of the Salisbury Barrack, and I said, I need an application. You all wow. need help. <laughs> Did you, I like that. Did you feel like the police were being lazy, or what, what, what did you feel like was going on? With, well, this, is, this is in the late 80s, the height of the, of the crack epidemic, if you will. I think their focus was on other things, and this just didn't rise to the priority that it should have. And do you feel like that uh, you being a part of the state police department that 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 s spoke more to what it was you wanted to achieve as opposed to a local police force? Yes, uh, I, I wanted to be one of the in an agency that was known for being the best trained and the most professional. So what's the difference between being in a local law uh, enforcement uh, agency versus something like both of you? Federal. We have fe your federal. But your state still. Yes. So, what is it like to be working at the state level and dealing? What challenges do you deal with at the state level? Oh well, the, a lot of the challenges we deal with are, are trying to stay uh, in concert with the community uh, because our officers, when they get promoted, there's, there's a lot of transferring and moving around, so there may not be as much stability. Um, so that there's a turnover, particularly in the, in the metropolitan areas. So trying to, um, and command staff as well, not just the troops. Uh, so trying to keep, build and maintain that, tr that trust in the community is, is always a challenge. Okay, but here we are talking about the state police trying to get trust in the community, when that is what local law enforcement is supposed to be doing, Matthew. That's uh, right, that's correct. It's, it's, it should be community policing. It should be working with the community. You should be, I've always said you should represent the people who you serve. And, um, if and you, that's not just, oh, I'm black and you're black. No, right. it's we're all citizens. We're all right. residents. I decided I wanted to serve and protect you, you know, and, and that means all of you. Right. But, but in reality, what we find is that in today's culture, because of racism is still a, pretty much a part of America, we find that people identify with people who they feel that looks like them. Um, you Especially know. because the problems continue. Right. It's not like, oh, it happened. No, 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 no. Just today, something. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's That's like exactly it's never, right. it's not never ending. It's, it's never ending. And so, if you want, you talking about community policing. You're talking about citizens 
reviewing some of the things that police do. I think these are good things that can happen. Citizens review boards, policing, having the, your police department resemble what your community looks like, um, you know, having more interaction with the community. What we're seeing today is a total different thing, and that's, I think that's why we're here, really. Exactly. That's exactly right. What is the training like um, when you decide to go into law enforcement? Do you receive different type of training if you're going to be um, a U.S. Marshal versus if you're going to be part of the state police department versus if you're going to be part of a local sure. agency? So, so speaking from Maryland, there are standards that are put out by the Maryland Police and Correctional Training Commission that we are required to follow. Uh, different agencies train differently. Larger departments like the state police, we have a six month live in academy um, and then an, exten an extensive um, on the job training with a, with a seasoned road patrol trooper after that. So how are you taught how to treat people? Because <laughs> I understand your training will include, you know, you gotta know how to shoot, you gotta know when, you gotta die, get, but w is there any training on how to treat your constituents? There has been, but I don't know if you can really train people on how to treat people. You either know how to treat people, you know, to give respect, to get respect, or you don't. Mm -hmm. And that, that is something that is very hard if someone doesn't come onto the job with that to be able to teach them how to do that. It can the be science done. science right there. And we have tried, that's right. but it hasn't been as successful as Ferguson has, has demonstrated. That's some science. And that's a psychology about it. Now, we have psychological training. You're supposed to have people that look at you and sit down and talk to you and they give you the MMPI and all of these psychological tests that determine if you react fast and how you deal with people. But again, it's a lot of discretion. It's a lot of how you treat people, your discretion. And see, the problem, the thing is, if you're another officer and you're with an officer and you see this officer treating someone the way that you don't believe they should be treated, now you've got that sort of blue wall, if you that blue wall of oh, sound, so that culture. We're if you talk speak that. out That's against right. it, then you got issues. Yeah. But yes, as as, as Captain Maddox said, uh, you know we should know how. I know how I want to be treated. That's right. That's really what it's all about. That's I right. treat people the way I want to be treated. That's right. Um, we're going to talk more about the blue wall of silence uh, in just a moment because uh, I want we've got to take a commercial break. But um, I want to talk to you for a second about being a woman. Uh, and being an officer, w what is that like? This woman wants to know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> were you were you treated differently? Were you? We could do a show on that. Of course, of course, of course, uh, of course I was treated differently. Uh, but I also met some of the most wonderful, great role models that I could ever have asked for. And you felt like people had your back. Yes. On the road, people had my back. In the boardroom boardroom as the politics uh, are what they are, maybe not so much, but yeah. Ah, the politics of it all. And so the politics enters all of this. That's right. I, look, look I, and, and tell me how you guys think about this. One of the ways I look and see, if, how, are we, how are we moving along in this country with respect to race? Well, let's see. How are white officers interacting with minority communities? How are minority officers interacting with white communities? What happened in Ferguson, New York, Los Angeles et al. tells me we have a racial problem in this country that a lot of us want to close our eyes and pretend it doesn't exist. Right. That's not the case. Absolutely not. And, and with these police incidents, it shows that we still have a lot of work to do because there is a deep, what I feel, a deep hatred toward the African American community and other minority communities from majority white police officers. Right. But, it, but, it, but it's, 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 it's not just hatred. It's fear. Hold that thought. We're going to come right back. We're going to continue our discussion with our two guests, our two wonderful law enforcement guests. Stay with us. And we're going to start with fear. We'll be right back. Yeah.